This is uh, my kitchen table and also my filing system. Over much of the past three decades, I've been an investor. The highest calling of mankind, I've often thought, was private equity. <laughs> and then I started interviewing. Well, I watch your interview because I know how to do some interviews. <laughs> I've learned in doing my interviews how leaders make it to the top. I asked him how much he wanted. He said 250. I said fine. I didn't negotiate with him and I did no due diligence. Told I have me. something I'd like to sell <laughs> and how they stay there. You don't feel inadequate now because being only the second wealthiest man in the world, is that right? Among the most revered institutions on Wall Street is Goldman Sachs. I had a chance recently to sit down at the Goldman Sachs offices in New York with its chairman and CEO, David Solomon. We had a chance to talk about the markets, the economy, and the Federal Reserve. So as we talk, uh, there was a gigantic drop in the market yesterday. The stock market, Dow Jones, went down by about 1,000 points or so. Uh, what precipitated this? And do you think this is an indication we're likely to have a recession in the near future? I think there are a couple of things that, uh, that have gone on over the last couple of days that contributed to the market volatility you know, we've seen really since Friday. The first is the jobs report on Friday indicated a slightly softer trajectory for the U.S. economy than people were expecting. I think it's important to pull back at a high level and just recognize it wasn't a horrible job report. It was just softer than people were expecting. And employment levels still remain pretty robust. But it certainly took market participants by surprise, is what I would say. And market participants have been well levered toward a very soft landing. And I think they now discount that soft landing a little bit more than they did prior to this one reading. The second thing that happened is the Bank of Japan tightened rates, tightened monetary policy for the first time in a long time. Money has been very, very easy in Japan, and investors around the world have basically been borrowing in yen and investing in U.S. Treasuries and getting a nice carry on that trade. And based on the Bank of Japan's movement, a bunch of investors began to unwind those trades. So all that created a little bit more market uncertainty and a little bit of volatility. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it extraordinary by any means. You know, I do think that we're getting a correction here after a very strong run in the markets, and that might be healthy. In terms of your question about a recession, our economists have upped their chance of a recession to 25% from 15%. You know, all of that, I think, is a little lower than the broad consensus. My view is that the best chance uh, as we look forward is, you know, the economy will chug along and we probably won't see a recession. But the possibility is not zero. It's never zero. Do you think there's a lot more pain to come in the financial markets, or are we basically avoiding a hard landing, so-called, and likely to glide through this for another year or two without any hard landing? I think we're going to see more volatility in the short term here. This was a pretty big, pretty meaningful correction and a big unwind of leverage, as we have discussed. Um, in, uh, in certain parts of the system. My guess is we'll see a little bit more rebalancing. Um, but my base case is still that there's a good chance the economy is still in reasonable shape. As we said a few moments ago, the jobs report, while it was disappointing, wasn't a bad jobs report. The unemployment levels are not bad unemployment levels. And so my base case is we're still set up you know, to kind of muddle through. But I do think in the short term here, the next couple of weeks, we might see a little bit more market volatility as this all rebalances. Before yesterday, you had earlier said that you thought one or two uh, rate cuts would be appropriate in September or before the end of the year uh, by the Fed. Uh, do you still think one or two rate cuts are coming? And are, should we do anything before September, in your view? Uh, I don't expect that you'll see anything before September. We do have a long period now. We've got 40 days until the next Fed meeting. Um, which actually I think is a you know, reasonable period of time for the market to digest more of the news. I'd say the market expectation is certainly for cuts in the fall. Uh, I've been more cautious around interest rate cuts all year. As you remember, the market expectation early in the year was for six or seven cuts. Based on the economic data we're seeing now and the messaging from the Fed, you know, I think it's likely that we'll see a cut or two in the fall. Um, but I think you've still got to wait and see as things unfold. And you know, the economic trajectory over the next couple of months and additional economic data will certainly have an impact on that. So, but the Fed's in a position, David, that if the economy does soften, and I think there are some data points, I've said this repeatedly, I think there are some data points that consumer behavior is softening a little bit. The Fed has the tools or the resources at this point to kind of bolster or cushion that. 
Well, some people say it would be a bad idea for the Fed to cut before the election because it will inject politics into the Fed's interest rate policy. Do you agree with that view? I, I think the Fed is an independent body. It has to act independently. It has to look at the data. You know, election timing shouldn't factor into their decisions. And I don't think this Fed's making decisions in any way, shape or form based on politics. Some people say the U.S. government doesn't really like a lot of mergers and acquisitions these days because the FTC and the Justice Department haven't approved as many mergers as maybe the business community would like. Uh, do you think that's been a big problem? And do you think the M&A market will be coming back at some point? The M&A market is actually doing OK. But to your point about coming back, and we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about the equity market, M&A volumes are running kind of 20 percent below 10-year averages. There's no question that the regulatory environment has an, an impact on that. Um, and I don't think the regulatory environment is as constructive and balanced as it should be you know, to ensure our competitive position in the world. And so I hope that adjusts. I think it will adjust you know, naturally. Um, I think the second factor that's impacted the M&A market is the financial sponsor community, the private equity community, has been a little bit turned off over the last two years. And I still think you know, we had a big reset coming out of the pandemic, and I think the private equity community is still wrestling with, you know, the value they perceive their assets to be versus the current, you know, kind of market value. And the incentive system really leads that community to wait. So M&A around that, you know, the sponsor community has been slower. I think both those things will normalize um, over time. There are natural cycles, but both of those have been headwinds to M&A activity in the short term here. In the investment world, one of the biggest phenomena of last year or two has been artificial intelligence. Everybody's obsessed with how to get ahead in artificial intelligence. Do you use artificial intelligence in running the firm or advising clients? How does the artificial intelligence affect you? We've used artificial intelligence to serve our clients and to operate the firm for decades. What's, what's changed is the accessibility of these large language models and the power and the speed of the compute that's now available on these new, these new GPU chips. And so I personally think, and I've said this publicly before, David, that this is gonna accelerate a change in business processes that's gonna be quite significant. And I think that's starting to happen right now. So some people have said AI is a bubble. We're in a bubble because people are fascinated by AI stocks and so forth. Would you call it a bubble or just maybe a modest correction we've had lately? I, I would not debate that whenever you have something new that's exciting, that stock market valuations can get ahead of themselves, you know, and, and, and can run ahead, but then ultimately adjust. You and I can go look at, you know, all sorts of things over our careers where we've seen that. But AI as an expanding technology, GPUs, increased compute capacity, the ability to use this in business process, it's not a bubble, it's a trend that we're in the early stages of seeing how it implements and affects business productivity. Valuations will go up and down. I'm not smart enough you know, to call tops and bottoms. So you've been the CEO uh, for about five years now? It'll be six years uh, next month. All right, six years. And in that time, your stock is more or less doubled and the market cap is more or less doubled. So is that the way you measure success or people measure your success? You've doubled the stock and are people always saying you should do more? And how do you measure your own success? I certainly think the growth of the firm and the growth of the market cap is, is an important component. We're here, we're a public company, and we're here to create value for our shareholders. Um, you know, in the context of you know, the last six years, I think we've grown the market cap you know, close to $100 billion. So I mean, it's been a big move in the market cap. And we've grown the firm meaningfully. We've taken the average revenues of the firm from kind of mid 30s, 34, 35 billion uh, to over $50 billion today. But there are other things that I think are very important when you're stewarding a great organization like this that are important and lead to you know, that, kind of, that kind of growth and improvement. The first is we are a client business. And if our clients don't trust the firm, if they don't trust the people that are serving them, if we're not building these trusting long-term relationships and serving them with excellence and distinction, we won't get those other outputs. Historically, Goldman made most of its money in investment banking and sales and trading. Those were the two linchpins. Are those still the two linchpins for Goldman Sachs? Uh, some of your peers, like Morgan Stanley, they have gone into the wealth management, private asset management business very heavily. Uh, you, you're in that as well. But are you still focused mostly on sales and trading and investment banking? Or are you expanding beyond those two pillars? Well, our global banking and markets business, which includes investment banking and our markets trading business, those are kind of the core franchises of the firm. And those are clearly businesses 
we're, we're a proven leader. Uh, you know, I think in investment banking, we're an undisputed leader, and we're certainly, you know, one of the top firms um, in all aspects of, of trading and markets. And that integrated franchise is our most significant business. Over the last few years, we've narrowed our strategy to make sure we can articulate to investors that we really have two big platforms that we're focused on. One is banking and markets, as we were just discussing. But we've also taken a number of asset management businesses that we have run for a long time around the firm and consolidated them into one platform with our extraordinary high net worth, ultra high net worth wealth management business to create what we call asset and wealth management. And that business is a $15 billion plus business. It's growing high single digits. We have a right to win. I'd say we're probably the top five or six active asset manager by assets under supervision and growing nicely. Talk about how you came to Goldman Sachs and the beginning of your career. So where were you born? I, I was born in White Plains, New York, just outside the city, north of the city. And uh, did you say to your father, I want to be in the uh, investment banking business someday? I want to be the head of Goldman Sachs? When I was in high school, David, I really didn't know a lot about investment banking um, or, you know, a lot about Goldman Sachs. Um, you know, my father was always interested in markets, but I, I thought I'd be a lawyer. Um, and you know, for a variety of reasons, uh, when I came out of school, I chose to interview uh, here in New York City uh, with a bunch of banking institutions. You know, you'll remember well in the early 1980s, uh, banks were hiring and creating training programs. And so I studied political science at Hamilton College, uh, real liberal arts education. And I was lucky enough to be hired by a bank, the Irving Trust Company, which was a very kind of staid commercial bank and started actually right across the street here in a training program in 1984. That's where I started my career and started to learn about finance, but I did not know much about it before that. In the reports I read about you, it said that you actually tried to get a job at Goldman Sachs out of Hamilton, and they turned you down. Uh, you then went to Irving. So have you ever found the person who turned you down? Is he still here or is she still here? Um, well, I, I, I don't know that there would be a person when I was first graduating from college, but Goldman Sachs was one of 40 or 50 firms that I sent a letter to asking for an interview. If I sent a letter to 50, it was one of the 45 that okay. came back and said, no, thank you. <laughs> um, so it would be hard to, it would hard to find one person. I also interviewed at Goldman um, when I'd been at Irving Trust for about a year for an analyst position um, and had done well, but ultimately, you know, was turned down um, in the last interview, um, you know, by a, by, by a partner that would have been in 1985. So I kind of two rejections um, from Goldman early in my career. Have you ever reminded that person that he turned you down? Or? Well, he, that, that person's no longer around, so can't be, can't be reminded. <laughs> so after Irving, uh, you went to um, Drexel Burnham? Well, I was applying to go to business school in, uh, in 1985, early 1986. I got recruited uh, to join a sales desk in the high yield department at Drexel Burnham. And so I kind of looked at the opportunity and I said, I'll put off business school and I'll go try this. Drexel was certainly a very interesting firm. The high yield business was kind of the epicenter of that firm at that point in time. And when it went out of business, were you worried about your career and how did you wind up at Bear Stearns? I, I, I certainly was worried about my career because I didn't have a, an MBA, but Drexel was a really interesting seminal experience. There were a lot of good things at Drexel. There were obviously, you know, a lot of things that weren't great at Drexel Burnham, but as a young you know, ambitious, uh, you know, associate in the, in the high yield bond department, I was able, I was given a lot of rope to learn, to grow, learn about the high yield bond market. And I really, that's when I really got hooked kind of on finance um, and really decided, hey, this is, this is pretty interesting. So when Drexel went out of business, I was like, okay, I got to find another job. And, you know, I, I, you know, interviewed around and 
you know, within a year, I wound up at Bear Stearns. At the end of 1990, I wound up at Bear Stearns. I made a short stop at Solomon Brothers, which is kind of forgotten in the history. But I wound up at, I wound up at Bear Stearns at the end of 1990, the beginning of 1991. So you left uh, Bear Stearns to come to Goldman Sachs in what, 1999? 1999. And Goldman went public around that time, is that right? In January of 1999, uh, John Winkery and ultimately Goldman Sachs started trying to recruit me. I was in a relatively senior position at Bear Stearns. And I, you know, I really wasn't interested, but John Winkery kept calling and calling and calling, and he caught me on a day where suddenly I said, you know what, I should really, I should really look at this. Um, and so in the summer of 1999, about two months after the IPO, I, uh, I joined the firm. Now, a smarter guy would have joined the firm two months before the IPO, but I, I waited until two months after. Well, I, I was trying to recruit you as well. Uh, you had a great reputation at Bear Stearns, and uh, worked out to come to Goldman. Uh, when you came to Goldman, did you think you could, you could be the CEO? Was that in your mind no, at that time? No, uh, absolutely not. I, I, I came to Goldman. I, you know, I had done very well at Bear Stearns um, and was in the leadership team. I was in the management committee at Bear Stearns in my, in my late 30s. And it was a hard decision to leave and come to Goldman because I kind of had to take a step back and kind of reestablish myself. But I always viewed Goldman Sachs as the most extraordinary firm you know, in our business. And it was a really good decision. I was incredibly impressed by the people I met, the people I saw. It's not that there weren't smart people at Bear Stearns, but the, the, the quality of the people I interacted with broadly, the position of the firm, the brand and the reputation of the firm was attractive. And so I made the leap um, and, uh, and joined as a partner in 1999. And my aspiration was only to learn, grow, do more of the business. I, I, I mean, there was, there was no way you could come to Goldman Sachs laterally and expect you'd ever be the, the CEO, you know, managing partner, the CEO of the firm. So you became the CEO and uh, now you've done it for about six years or so. So what's the greatest pleasure about being CEO? Well, I, I think it goes back to what you and I were talking about before. It's, it's, the, it's the extraordinary people that you work with here at the firm. It's the extraordinary people that you get to interact with all over the world. The, the learning process just never stops. And it's an incredible firm filled with incredible people doing super interesting things that marries kind of capital and ideas to drive growth in the economy. And to be in the middle of that, a part of that is stimulating, exciting, interesting, purposeful. And I really, I enjoy it. But the thing that I really, it's the people, David. The, the thing that's incredible about this job is the people. The people at the firm, the, the clients, you know, who we work with, that's, that's really what, what makes this job so exciting. You know, one of the things that I think we look for is people that are smart, but people that want to work hard, people that believe in excellence, people that want to win. So let's talk about Goldman itself. Um, Goldman has how many employees now? 46,000. How hard is it to get a job at Goldman out of college? It's often said that Goldman has more resumes than any other firm practically in the world of people from really good schools who want to join here. So let's suppose somebody goes to a really good school or average school and they want to get an entry level job at Goldman. What are the chances of that happening? So for an entry level, level job out of undergraduate university, we received last year a little over 300,000 applications and we hired about 2,500 people. So it's, it's super competitive. I mean, it's less than 1% uh, of the people who apply for an out of university job are ultimately selected. We recruit from a very broad selection of schools and universities all over the world. It's one of the things that we've really tried to expand. So uh, if somebody is watching and says, I wanna work at Goldman Sachs or I want my child or my grandchild to get a job here, what, is, what do you most look for? It's high IQ, great work ethic, um, majoring in uh, a STEM kind of subject or what? Well, when we talk about joining out of school, you know, there's a wide range of jobs at the firm. There are people that are coming that are interested in interviewing for an investment banking job. There are people that are interested in interviewing for a trading job. We hire a lot of engineers. The firm is 45,000 employees. We have over 10,000 engineers at the firm, so we hire a lot of engineers. Obviously, the engineering jobs are STEM-oriented. So there are a variety of different skill sets that can be successful here. We have a huge uh, infrastructure in the firm that we call the CFNO that supports 
you know, all the frontline businesses. We run our businesses front to back, and we have all sorts of functions that are very, very important to allow us to serve our client, clients across the firm. And there are different skills, but I think there are some common themes. And, you know, one of the things that I think we look for is people that are smart, but people that want to work hard, people that believe in excellence, people that want to win, people that have proven that they've got grit and determination and an ability to both succeed, but also when they fail to pick themselves up and dust themselves off and keep going. And so, you know, I think you look for a package of skills. Of course, intellect's a part of it, but there are other softer things that ultimately you and I know with, with a lot of experience, you know, in this business, there are other softer things that, that ultimately make people really successful over the long run. And we, we have a very diverse group of people that come through and people go in different directions. And some people excel and some people move on and do other things. Is the job of being the CEO of Goldman Sachs as much fun as, as uh, some people think it must be? Because so many people want this job. Are you enjoying the job or is it more aggravation than sometimes you really thought it would be? Well, I'm, I'm certainly enjoying the job. This is an incredible institution. As you highlight, there are, there are many who have come before me that have led this great institution over its 155 years. And I have the, the you know, I'm very, very lucky to have the opportunity to steward, you know, this great organization and help it serve our clients and to grow our business. And, and it, um, it gives me an incredible opportunity to interact with all sorts of interesting people. And really, given the nature of our client business, to be at the center of kind of the intersection of ideas and capital. So as the CEO of Goldman Sachs, what do you most worry about? What keeps you up at night? Well, for a long, long time, what kept me up at night was worrying about my kids. But now that they're 32 and 30, you know, I worry about them a little bit less. But, hey, but on, a, on a more serious note, you know, broadly speaking, I'm concerned about the level of debt in the world, level of government debt in the world, and kind of the growth in spending and the sustainability of it over time. And I, I, don't, I don't want to be an alarmist, and I don't, I don't think that, that there's a reckoning that's pending immediately. But ultimately, we need a set of policy decisions that help us you know, deal with the trajectory of spending, the level of debt, the cost of that debt. And I think that the money has been very easy for a long time, and I think that's, that's created some behaviors that ultimately we're going to have to reckon with. And so that's something we're spending a lot of time thinking about and, you know, we're concerned about, it. not immediately, but concerned over time. Two of your predecessors, Bob Rubin and Hank Paulson, became Secretary of the Treasury. Do you aspire to go into government if the President of the United States called you from a, either Democrat or Republican, said, I want you to come in and serve your country as Secretary of the Treasury, would you ever do that? I, at the moment, I'm focused on running Goldman Sachs. And um, I think we've made good progress on the growth uh, and the trajectory of the firm. I think there's more to do. Um, I've been very, very you know, fortunate over the course of, of, of my career. Could there be a time in the future where in some way, shape or form, I'd like to give back? You know, absolutely, but that's not now. Right now I'm focused on, on Goldman Sachs and, and, and helping Goldman Sachs move forward. What was the best advice any of your predecessors gave you about running Goldman Sachs? You know, I'm lucky. I've gotten lots of good advice from Lloyd Blankfein, from Hank Paulson, from John Corzine from Steve Friedman, um, you know, very, very lucky to have the opportunity to, to, you know, to talk and to hear, you know, from them all about things they learned, you know, during their time, um, you know, running the firm. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's lots of great advice that, that, that helps you make better decisions. There's no, there's no one standout piece of advice, but here's what I know. We make, we make some good decisions, we make some bad decisions. The most important thing, David, is when you make bad ones, to make adjustments, to always be open to learn and to change, um, and try to make sure you always keep your compass pointed to true north.